thanks to the Southern Rockies LCC for having me. Uh, before we jump in, I want to acknowledge my co-author on this, Thomas Edwards, who's the PI of the project. And this is a joint effort between uh, ourselves at Utah State University and uh, three other labs. All the remote sensing has been done at the University of Maryland's Global Land Cover Facility. And then we have other collaborators in Arizona at NAU and uh, in Las Vegas, Nevada, in the uh, USGS offices there at the Southwest Science Center. Uh, one thing to make note of up front, as Mary said, this is a NASA-funded project, and one of the main questions I get from people is, what is NASA's interest in wildlife management? And so it's worth noting up front that uh, NASA's interest in our project is not in wildlife management per se, but in the dissemination of satellite imagery to as wide a range of natural resource and, well, applications generally. And so our project is part of the biodiversity and ecological forecasting problem uh, program, pardon me. Uh, and our efforts are focused on wildlife management. And there are several other projects uh, in that program that have similar themes. Uh, so the main thing to take note of up front is the science needs identified by the Mule Deer Working Group within the SRLCC. And these are threefold, uh, delivery of information related to the limiting factors for mule deer in the West, the development of tools that re use remotely sensed data to assess habitat quality and then approve the efficiency, accuracy, and cost effectiveness of the current monitoring programs. And what these all really have in common is the use of satellite imagery to monitor mule deer habitat and or demography. And so the results I'm gonna present today encompass this theme of habitat variation as influenced by climate through vegetation and then the demographic effects of that. So importantly, the Southern Rockies LCC covers the Four Corners region and this is the fastest growing region in the country with five of the fastest growing states and then similarly it's also the driest part of the country. And most of this, these changes are leading to what uh, projections that forecast a, a further drying, and not only drying, but also changes in the seasonality of precipitation. And so what, this is going to be one of the most important changes undergo, that the region will undergo with respect to large herbivores and their abundance, their distribution, and their habitat use is this change in seasonality. And I'll, show you some data on this subject momentarily. Um, so the question is, we have more people, we have more growth driving land use change and less water. And what does this mean for some of our big game species? So population growth leads to changes in land use in the form of urbanization, energy development, water development, recreational pursuits, and all of these collectively result in habitat loss and or fragmentation. And then overlaid on this are these climate changes that we're discussing of warming temperatures and um, a separation of our precipitation regime into something more bimodal. And so what do these mean? And what is, why is this important um, for mule deer particularly? And really abundance and distribution is of central concern for all of our Western wildlife agencies uh, of mule deer and other big game species. And this derives from the economic impacts associated with hunting, uh, highway collisions, and associated cost of property values and, and human welfare and agricultural conflicts. And then we also have ecological impacts of mule deer abundance or the variation abundance on biodiversity, most notably in this region uh, in the form of aspen regeneration and other controversial management techniques such as predator control. And so all of these boil down to a number of social conflicts that form around the, the perception of the number of animals, whether it be too many or too few. And so for these reasons, we were interested in using satellite imagery to make predictions about how animals, mule deer in particular, respond to climatic signals. And our research concept really takes a bottom-up view of the world. Um, we make the assumption that climate drives vegetation and that vegetation, changes in vegetation, translate into herbivore abundance and behavior. 
and then those changes ultimately end up at the highest trophic levels. Now we acknowledge that there are top-down effects, but for the time being we were focused on first climate and the fact that we don't we cannot control it, but to the degree that we can make predictions about its behavior or anticipated changes, this gives us knowledge to make decisions about the, the trophic levels that we can manipulate through management, be that habitat restoration or um, population control of consumers. Now for today, we really won't be talking about any of these top-down effects, but just keep in mind we are working on these in the background and those results are forthcoming. This approach, this bottom-up approach, really stems from this idea of trophic uh, transfer of energy across trophic levels and the idea that climatic variation will have effects on the primary producers or the, uh, um, the vegetation layer and that during times of drought that contracts and these contractions in primary production translate into consumers in some form or another. And conversely, during wet periods we get an expansion or greater production that also can be translated. And ungulates in particular as herbivores are tracking these, these climatic signals through forage. And so it follows then that small changes at the level of primary production can have progressively stronger impacts as we move up through the trophic levels. So essentially changes in primary production, which are relatively easy to map through satellite imagery, um, translate to these higher levels and that we can, we can monitor that. So the research questions we were focused on really um, were quite simple. How do we use NDVI to evaluate mule deer abundance, migration, and habitat use with respect to these two major factors of interest, climate and land use? So specifically, how does climate affect mule deer demography? How do climate and land use influence mule deer migration? And then lastly, how can we use satellite observations of vegetation phenology to inform wildlife management, be it through uh, decision making or monitoring? So the study region for our project is the better part of the Intermountain West, which almost completely contains the Southern Rockies LCC. Um, our, our project started with a focus on the Colorado Plateau that evolved, it expanded, and so um, because we are housed in Utah and we have a, a working relationship with the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, most of the data that you're going to see are from Utah and to some degree Arizona, who is also a collaborator on this. Now the inference is drawn from uh, mapping and monitoring primary production through satellite imagery. And so the vegetation metrics we're using are largely NDVI. And this is a MODIS product that's collected daily. Our data goes back to the year 2000 and ends December 31st of 2014. That we keep, hope to keep this updated on an annual basis. These measures are taken daily and are used um, a 500 meter spatial resolution. And this is scaled from zero to one. Now importantly, each of these layers represents a single day for the, the 15 years of interest here. And those can be um, statistically summarized to get a variety of data that we derive from them, uh, the phenological metrics. So one of these is the season peak NDVI, so it's the NDVI value, the highest value for the year and the associated date the year integrated, which is the total productivity for the year, a volatility index, which shows the variation across space in NDVI, and then the dates for the average start of season, peak of season, and end of season. <coughs> and then we have all of these also uh, for the monsoon region or the, the southern part of the study area that's affected by these summer thunderstorms. And so it's important to recognize that these are not off-the-shelf metrics. NDVI is available for free, but what we've done is we've created a data set representing every day of the year over this 15-year interval and then derive these metrics from it. Now the response variables are 
are measures that we've acquired largely through the state agencies and to some extent um, data that we had on hand from prior studies. They come in two forms. So the map on the left is the summer range for mule deer uh, from northern Utah down into central Arizona. And all of these have um, harvest metrics and uh, fawn counts associated with them. We also have st six study areas where we have far more intensive data uh, from a number of animals uh, colored with GPS telemetry. Uh, the nature of the data are these, so we're using fawn counts from the year 04 to 12 and then population estimates for Utah only from 07 to 13. And then the GPS study sites represent about 100 animals and those are taken intermittently over this interval from 2000 to 2015. So we'll see some summary data um, from each of these data sets. So our first question, how does climate affect mule deer demography? And before we dive into the data, I'd like to show you a video animation of NDVI over the course of the seasons. And so what you'll see is the study area, the broader study area, going through seasonal changes as measured with NDVI. And there's three things I'd like to, you to take note of. First, the precession of winter snow from north to south. And what you'll see is the shortest seasons in the Yellowstone area and the longest um, getting down into Arizona. A uh, heavy winter snowpack ending at 37 degrees north, which roughly coincides with the Utah-Arizona state line. And then lastly, this monsoonal moisture pulse that you'll see coming out of the south um, from Mexico. And so just watch this for a moment. And I'll, I'll point out some things here. Um, the, the Yellowstone region has the shortest growing season which gets, extends, um, it becomes greater in length as you move south. Note also, um, here's the, the date. As we get into late summer, this green pulse that comes up out of Mexico, that's the monsoonal signal that really is strongest in southeastern Arizona, but goes as far north as the Mugion Rim here. And that becomes important momentarily. This. The, the Southern Rockies ecoregion that we're focused on really falls between these two extremes of a desert summer moisture regimen and then a moisture regimen really driven by winter snowpack. So to look at this in, graphically, the patterns are actually very strong. What we see is that snowfall remains fairly constant ac across this latitudinal gradient, again, standing, extending from northern Utah down into central Arizona. And what this demonstrates is that regardless of latitude, the amount of um, annual moisture falling as snow remains roughly constant. However, the amount falling as summer rain uh, differs dramatically. And so what we see is in the far north, um, wet winters, wet snowy winters, relatively dry summers, and the summers becoming far wetter as we move southward. So 34 degrees represents uh, about central Arizona. And then conversely, what we see in terms of some, or, uh, spring moisture is exactly the opposite of summer. Springs are fairly dry in Arizona, getting progressively wetter. So looking at the whole gradient, what we see is a snowy winter in the north followed by wet, mild springs go, moving into a, a relatively dry summer, and then exactly the opposite on the southern end of the, the gradient, a wet winter, a dry spring, and then a wet summer. And this has implications for the way these animals behave, uh, reproductive patterns, and migration. So to look at this in a different way, here's, here are our moisture um, patterns. The blue represents winter dominant and then green summer dominant, and then a lot of variation in between those extremes. And what we can derive from this are phenological profiles. And so what this demonstrates is that these areas in the far north at about 41 degrees north latitude show a very strong pulse coming out of winter, rapid plant growth, hitting a peak in June or July, and then 
trailing off. And importantly, this thick band represents the time frame over which mule deer are giving birth. And so <clears throat> this dry summer creates a fairly steep drop off. As we move south at about 37 degrees north, which would be the Kaibab here in Arizona and then some of these units in southern Utah, we see a gentler curve. You still have snowfall or a spring snow melt leading to a rapid green up. The deer are giving birth a little bit later, but you're starting to pick up some of this monsoonal moisture, which carries the growing season out quite a ways. And so you have a fairly flat signal and then again a steep drop off. And if we move even further south, down into the Sonoran Desert, we see something that's altogether different, where, again, there is some green up following winter, but a flat period, and then this very pronounced spike associated with monsoonal moisture coming in, in mid to late summer. And the deer are giving birth progressively later, always falling on the inflection point of these growth curves. So this is the data shown in a slightly different way. The the regression on top shows the date for the peak of season. So this is the date at which the NDVI signal is the strongest, ranging from, these are uh, Julian dates essentially, at the northern end, this is early to mid-June, and then at the southern end, we're getting into the uh, middle to late August for when the peak of season hits, which indicates in these monsoonally driven areas, the plants are actually responding, have a stronger response to the summer moisture, and in turn, the deer are timing their reproductive activity, uh, birthing to that summer pulse, which is what this second regression shows, or the approximate dates of birthing, tracking that signal. Now, importantly, there's a cost to this in that the monsoon is highly variable in both space and time, and, and it varies tremendously from year to year. And so when we look at the fawn data that have been provided by the state agencies, what we see is a very clear pattern of um, the uh, uh, annual productivity tracking that signal. So. We have our highest fawn counts in the far north, and they get progressively lower as we move south. So these are the average annual counts in the dark gray circles. The white circles represent an index of interannual variation, which is the coefficient of variation. And what we see is, again, in the north, we see the highest mean fawn counts. And these are taken in uh, late autumn, early winter, and the lowest levels of interannual variation. And then conversely, on the southern end of the spectrum, we see low average fawn production and a great deal of interannual variability. And we think this is essentially tracking the climatic signals that they're following. Now, importantly, this is not an index of recruitment. Ultimately, deer may be recruiting the same number of animals across the board. But what we can infer from this is that deer um, in the north have better better conditions and, and higher summer survival, but the cost is that they're dealing with these uh, winters defined by heavy snowpack, whereas deer at the southern end don't have the same amount of snow to contend with, but they do have this fluctuation in when the resources arrive um, during birthing. And so we would assume from this that mort fawn mortality is higher in the, the south uh, during summer and more than likely higher in the north uh, during winter and the following spring. So to summarize that, all of that goes, this graph really just, just makes a finer point of it. Again, we have the fawn count data showing the mean annual um, fawn counts. And this is an index of evapotranspiration showing that uh, the water stress at the southern end of our study site is highest or highest in the south, lowest in the north. And so evapotranspiration is inversely correlated with fawn production. And the data for these are also readily available um, from satellite-derived indices, and we can map this. So when we, when we look at um, density or, or abundance estimates, what we see is that, again, NDVI 
particularly on the summer range taken during the time of the birthing season is a strong predictor of abundance. And so what we've done here is taken the the abundance estimates on a management unit basis from Utah and regress them on NDVI during the date of birth, which, which in Utah is roughly the month of June. Um, these other, other uh, this extension into Arizona and in Nevada, Colorado, Idaho, et cetera, is just an extrapolation, so take that with a grain of salt. But this uh, model represents a spatial depiction of the density estimates uh, from Utah, showing this very strong relationship between the abundance of deer and the um, value of NDVI during the month of birth. And each of these data points represents a different management unit. Okay, so on to the second question, how does climate and land use influence mule deer seasonal movements? And again, I want to start with a heuristic of um, looking at some animals moving uh, seasonally in response to climate, climatic, uh, well, vegetation driven by climate. So I'm going to show you two animals. One is an elk from Monroe Mountain. I really want you to focus on the spring migration for this animal. And you'll see two things that are quite interesting. One is this probing behavior of the snow line during late winter, so about March, April. This animal is, is constantly checking the recession of the snow line. And then at about the time uh, she's giving birth, she's tracking um, what, what's known as the green wave, the, the phenological wave. As snow recedes and grasses are emerging, she starts tracking this. And then the second video is of a mule deer. And that, I really want you to focus on the fall migration. What you'll see is that spring migration is initiated when the summer range is green and that fall uh, seems to be triggered by the first major snowstorm. So here's the elk and it's not a deer but very similar life history. Um, and so what you'll see here is that this animal is wintering at a relatively low elevation down here. And these are some of these probing movements. All of the white or gray represents snow. So there's no NDVI signal because it's buried in snow. And then the other colors represent winter range plants. And you'll see the snow is receding. Green up is progressing up the mountain. And there are these continual probings back to winter range. And then come middle of April, she's commits to some movement, moves north, it's probably a transitional range here because it's still relatively low, and then here she starts tracking this green wave as it's moving up the mountain up to about, this is um, about 10,000 feet elevation, and she tracks that, and then ultimately by late June the snow is gone, and she um, resides on summer range. Now the deer shows a slightly different pattern. And this is a deer down near Zion National Park, the very southern part of the state, the, um, near the Arizona state line, which is represented by this white line here. And so this animal is wintering the relatively low elevation and then again going up to about 9,000 feet. Again, you see the, the green up progressing upslope. And this is where her summer range is. So this is still buried in snow in the middle of April. But she starts to move and we've slowed down the migration, but it takes about five days. And then by the time she reaches her summer range, it's completely green. The snow has receded to the highest elevations. And then she just hunkers down for about four months. So what you'll see here momentarily is that as we get into October, 
you'll see some white appear here. This is the highest elevations, and you'll see some. Uh, the white is essentially no data, and that uh, reflects NDVI is not measurable through water, and so um, no data is indicative of snow, and we'll see how she behaves when that first snowstorm hits in the middle of October. Okay, there's the snow starting to appear. Larger snowstorm. And then that seems to be the cue to, to head back to winter range. So I, I provide these just to demonstrate that that these um, seeing how animals respond in with uh, respect to NDVI. NDVI is a, a really a good predictor is in this part of the world. Uh, because it's arid, we get a lot of clear days, and we see these dramatic differences in plant communities from our low elevations to our upper elevations, transitioning from a sagebrush rangelands up into conifer and aspen forests. So to look at, at migration in space, snow has been identified as the major predictor of this in that uh, where snow depth exceeds about 10 inches, these are areas where deer tend to migrate. And so if we look at Again, our transect from northern Utah down into central Arizona, this represents the average elevation of the summer ranges, and it's getting lower as one moves southward. And associated with that decline in elevation are also declines in the average snowpack. So the, the snowflakes represent the mean, and then these bars are the 95% confidence intervals. And what you see is that if we use this 250, 250 millimeters as a threshold, that is met or exceeded most of the time in these northern units. In this transition from areas of high snowpack to relatively low snowpack occurs right about 37 degrees north, which again is the state line. So the Kaibab really is the, the um, major exception on the Arizona side where, where some of these conditions are met. So from that, we can say we can predict areas where deer are going to have a largely migratory strategy seasonally, acknowledging that this does vary tremendously from year to year. And then conversely, areas where migration may be more of a, a facultative strategy, where, the, where it, it may be expressed during particularly heavy years, but often um, there's little or no migration, or at least not to the same degree as what you see in these northern areas. So we can map places where deer ha exhibit certain migratory strategies. We can also map this in time. So I'll walk you through this graph. What you see is time. This is the extended growing season on the x-axis. These are our NDVI values. The green line represents the phenological curve for this individual's summer range. This is on Boulder Mountain. Summer range is about 9,500 feet. The blue line represents the winter range for the same individual 3,500 feet lower down in the, the sagebrush bottomlands. And so what we see is that her movement from winter range to summer range, the date of her spring migration, coincides with the inflection point of the growth curve on her summer range. And this, just as a, a, a visual cue, uh, is roughly when the aspen are starting to leaf out. And this is when because on these high elevation summer ranges, aspen is the major deciduous plant. It produces a very strong signal that's readily detectable through NDVI. So she uh, migrates to summer range. Here's another view of it, the middle of May. And then in the fall, late September, she migrates down back to her, her uh, winter range. And what you see here is that she's leaving as the phenological curve is really dropping off. And this coincides with the bearing of the aspen trees in either the first frost or, as I showed you in the video, an early, early autumn snowstorm. This seems to be the trigger. So we can map these out in time. She's also catching her winter range. You'll notice it's bimodal. This is the green up associated with uh, winter, or uh, sorry, spring snow melt. And then this is the monsoonal effect. This, this particular animal lives in the southern part of the state. And so she's catching 
there's still some remaining productivity on the winter range before it, it bottoms out. So mule deer seem to respond. Um, we can pick up these, these migration signals through NDVI. They also respond to land use change. So in this slide, what we see, each color represents a different individual, and they all exhibit a different migration strategy. Notably, all of these animals were captured on a common winter range. This is the Camp Williams National Guard base where we've been working for 15 years, the southern end of the Salt Lake Valley. And what we see is that for these animals, there's really only one that exhibits the classic strategy of moving up slope in elevation. And for all the others that are using different strategies, they're being exposed to uh, highways and subdivisions along the way. And so one of our questions here is, how does this affect uh, winter range limitation? You know, urbanization as one of the major land use changes in the West. Um, what does that mean for winter ranges? What does it mean for migratory routes? And are there fragmentation thresholds beyond which some of these strategies will simply cease to exist? And so to take this and look at it from a little different perspective, this is one of, we caught the animal here on what we thought was her winter range. It was actually transitional. This is her summer range. This is her winter range. And this is what she's exposed to along the way, our places undergoing very rapid land use change in the form of urbanization. So this is the little town of Cedar Fort. It's a, a rapidly growing subdivision. It's largely driven by commuters uh, or people commuting into the Salt Lake Valley for work. As you can see, there's a, um, a lot of growth in here and a, a major highway. And so as these animals cross it, they're exposed to anthropogenic threats. The same animal on the northern end of her study site, or sorry, her migration route, um, is moving through this area, which is characterized by low density ranches, um, low density housing, you know, five, eight, five, 10 acre parcels with um, livestock and but a lot of a lot of roads a lot of cars a lot of people a lot of dogs and a lot of fences so the migration routes or certain parts of them end up being uh, vulnerable to these changes and then of course all the, the associated problems that come with that whether it's um, uh, collisions with cars and then uh, attracting carnivores into the suburbs and, and, and things like that Okay, our last question is quite simply, how can satellite observations of plant phenology inform wildlife management? Two little tidbits I want to leave you with. One is, is answering this question with respect to habitat um, manipulations and the other demographics and what can we learn about um, monitoring or predicting deer abundance using some of these resources. So the Southern Rockies, ecoregion has um, some very similar uh, topography, similar climate, and similar issues among states related to big game. And so importantly, I think one of the easiest things to come away with is that these deciduous plant communities are very important habitat-wise. As NDVI is one of our major predictors, it was the month of June or the, or the month during which deer were giving birth that had the strongest predictive power. And so we simply stepped back and said, what's driving June NDVI? And there are two things driving it. One is deciduous vegetation. So from a spatial standpoint, we can say that units that have a larger percentage of deciduous vegetation, primarily in the form of aspen, are of greater value. And so those, to the extent possible, might be a place to focus resources on restoration or conservation. Now in time, it seems to that moisture during the spring growing season is very important. And this does vary tremendously from year to year. Um, but spring precip has a very strong effect on June and DBI. So places that get more spring moisture or years in which that uh, pulse is stronger are going to have a greater beneficial effect on mule deer habitat. In terms of demographics, what we've demonstrated with, with our uh, population estimates and converting those into densities is that, again, June NDVI is a very strong predictor 
of abundance. And one of the things we're doing right now is trying to calibrate these estimates and, and see are they reasonable or not, and what are the, the local factors that may influence them one way or the other. But from a spatial standpoint, uh, units with high NDVI during June seem to carry more deer, and this is simply a matter of they're more productive. Um, it, it's not a, a mystery. Um, but the same holds true in time. So this is a collection of units in western Utah on the Great Basin side of the state that's the driest, and in the driest areas, NDVI has the, seems to have the strongest predictive abilities. And what we see is that our, our fawn counts they're collected in the fall, are tracking quite nicely with the NDVI values from the prior spring when those fawns were born. So the point being that NDVI during the birthing season has a lot of value for assessing or indexing abundance or trends in abundance. So if our goal ultimately in applying some of the satellite imagery and these uh, models is to take a static map of presence or absence, or say species distribution, and our goal is to inform that further or enhance it by incorporating demographic parameters. And so taking what we have here as presence or absence and then converting it into something that's more informative for management and for making predictions. This is density. We um, have shown this with productivity or annual fawn production, and then we have a student that's working on a similar map using our adult survival rates uh, for does to do the same thing. So our take-home points, uh, climate through its effect on vegetation can influence mule deer demography. And importantly, these effects, uh, we've been able to detect them through standard survey data. So the fawn counts that are collected on an annual basis are actually picking up some of these signals, albeit at large scales. Interannual variation in plant phenology is measurable with satellite imagery, so these models can be parameterized using NDVI. Um, deer abundance varies predictably with NDVI, and these predictions, while you, I'm not advocating that anyone go and start making decisions based on them, they can at least be a place to um, make some preliminary estimates and calibrate the information that we have and come up with some um, uh, estimated densities uh, for given areas under given conditions. And that by tracking range conditions, whether it's through satellite imagery or combining it with on the ground measurements of plants can give us a lot more information and inference about trends of in abundance. NDVI provides uh, a fairly affordable, uh, that's qualified, our stacks were a, a product that we built outside of what's readily available, but there are NDVI um, data available for free download. Um, it provides an affordable, timely, and synoptic tool for indexing deer habitat, and we've used this. What you've seen today is really state and regional in scale, but we have used it as well at, at the management unit scale. So it can, you can um, use it at finer scales. And that this can be used to predict movements, and this is to either identify conflict hotspots or migration routes with respect to some of the ongoing land use change in this region, whether it's urbanization, uh, recreation, or energy development. And then lastly, we can use that to prioritize management actions, whether it be habitat restoration, uh, predator manipulation, um, annual changes to harvest, et cetera. These, uh, the, the data give us a, an assessment of uh, range trends and interannual variation in uh, forage or, or an index of forage uh, quality and abundance. So with that, I'm, I'm going to leave it there. I'm, I'm quite happy to take questions, and I, I, one of the reasons that I wanted to deliver this was that for our project, NASA, again, is interested in seeing this go toward the managers, um, exposing the, some of the products that are available, and so I'm, I'm really eager to get feedback as to how this might be improved, uh, what 
some of the oversights have been some of because obviously there's a lot of uh, simplifying assumptions, but you know, where do we focus our efforts from here? And I think the Southern Rockies LCC was a a really nice place to start by bringing uh, natural resource managers together and, and uh, providing this this overview. So that's the end of my talk. Um, I'm I'm happy to stick around for another 15 or 20 minutes and answer questions. Thanks so much, Dave. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Actually, we have, you know, like Dave said, 15 or 20 minutes uh, for questions or comments, feedback. Um, just to remind you, there's two ways you can ask questions. You can either unmute yourself and ask a question via phone. You unmute yourself by pressing star six. Uh, when you're done asking your questions, feel free to remute yourself or to mute yourself pressing star six again. Or you can type the, your questions into the chat box and send them to the host, and then I can read them to Dave. So if anybody has like would like to, well, people are formulating questions or comments, and does anybody have a qu uh, question they'd like to ask by phone? If you do, please unmute yourself by pressing star six. Is that someone with a question? In the meanwhile, uh, I just want to let everybody know that I'll be following up with you all uh, with a link to the recording via email, as well as with links to the um, YouTube videos that Dave shared with you, and also uh, Dave and uh, Tom's contact information. I haven't received any comments via the chat box yet, or no one's asked a question via phone, but we're open for business. So, <laughs> hey, Dave, do you have anything that you want to pose to the audience? Oh, wait, we have a question, so I'm going to read it to you. Okay. All right. Uh, this is from Rich. You showed an individual deer migration route around Cedar Mountain from 2000. How many individuals did you have collared, and how many years did you follow them? So that data set, and I should, going back to the, all the GPS data sets, um, were collected for different reasons at different times, you know, different study objectives. Uh, Cedar Mountain was focused on deer and elk interactions with livestock on the summer range, and there were seven deer and, and seven or eight elk collared at that time. That was really when GPS was just hitting the, the market or you know, being incorporated into these studies. And those animals were monitored for uh, some of them for a year, some for, for two years, but two, two rounds of migration maximum on that site. On some of the other sites, we've gotten more more data, um, the Monroe and Ochre Mountain studies that overlap with where I did my my mountain lion research, uh, those animals, we've got 30 of them between the two sites that incorporated two and even three um, round trip migrations. So those data are in development. Thanks, Dave. We have a question from Jeff. Has this have these products used any of the off? Oh, has this project used any of the off-the-shelf phenology products? And have they evaluated the uncertainty of land surface phenology products and the implications of that uncertainty for this type of work? Great question, and I should note that I'm the animal half of the the project. We've got we're working with GLCF. They do all the remote sensing. We have not used any of the off-the-shelf phenology products. Um, the phenology metrics that we used were developed from the stacks, which was specific to this project. Uh, in terms of uncertainty, there's a lot of it. Uh, one of the problems that we run into in this part of the world is um, particularly capturing the start of the season because of late 
well, spring snowstorms at high elevations that wipe out the signal and then melt and then suddenly you have a strong signal. And so that makes certain times of the year very difficult and that's where you see the most error um, in terms of measuring, getting dates. The One of the, the major problems that we've brushed up against over and over again is that with 500 meter pixels, you're sweeping in the signal from a lot of different plants, and, and by that I mean different communities, and it's all aggregated into one signal. So um, the, the remote sensing guys on the project have just put together a paper that's, I believe it's in review, on phenological unmixing and trying to uh, get different spectral signals from different plant communities. And they succeeded in this using a simple community in northern Arizona that's comprised of pine trees and grasslands. And they were able to separate this, the different signals from the grasslands from the pine trees. Um, really, and I think this goes to the earlier question, um, one of the things that's left that we need is exactly that calibration with on the ground measurements and how how our um, range measures correlated with or how can they be used to correct some of these um, remotely sensed indices. Um, and this um, next question kind of goes with that from Angela. It says in the yeah in the satellite imagery it you know, aspen is, was obvious, as noted, but does it distinguish shrub for grass weed? Yeah, well, that's that's where we've taken a lot of criticism. No, the, the short answer is no. Um, with, conceivably, with a finer-grained image, uh, you could get some homogeneous pixels of, say, grasses, shrubs, and then the different forest types and, and, and calibrate. But no, um, they're all in the mix. And so those phenological curves that I showed are really aggregates of the community as a whole. Um, and other than this unmixing project, uh, which is, is somewhat related to that, that question, um, separating out different um, life forms or, or community types, um, that's in the works. Again, we've done it with a, two, a simple two-community pixel. Um, the next thing would be to, to um, apply that to, say, shrub communities. Um, but yeah, right now, grasses, forbs, you know, the, the things the deer are actually eating are, are not, that, that's not exactly what we are measuring. They are in the mix, but only with everything else. And so the curves are an index of the total um, the signal for the entire community and not of any one um, uh, life form. Thanks, Dave. I don't have any more questions in the queue unless somebody has a question by phone or wants to type something in. We'll give it a minute or a minute and see if anybody else wants to ask a question. Do you have any um, I should ask you this, Dave. Do you have any closing comments or other information that you want to convey to the audience before we sign off? Well, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm really interested in feedback from the from the agencies and how some of this might be used and or improved, and where the the oversights are. Uh, this is uh, it's really important that we calibrate these these things, and um, I've just been very pleased with the fact that um, the NDVI seems to be a really strong predictor, and I, I think that's largely the, the climate. The, the arid, mountainous climate is very conducive to remote sensing, and so um, we have a real a real benefit in that. But again, until it, it makes sense with what's happening on the ground, that it's, it remains largely a model or a prediction that's unvalidated. Right. You know, we did have one more question come in, kind of related to climate, uh, the migration. Um, what do you think the relationship is between climate and migration routes? Well, that's a great question. One thing I, I didn't 
dwell on was that we know broadly where deer will migrate based on the areas that that hold a lot of snow, um, but we don't we we can't yet predict the actual routes. Um, I mean, we we can on study areas where we have data, but but ultimately, if we want to predict the actual routes these animals are taking, um, interpolating among sites, because we're never going to have you know, GPS deer over every environment where of interest. Um, that's that's the hole in this, and there's been some good work in Wyoming done on that, predicting routes. I think there's a lot of um, behavior that that's not predictable with imagery or related to um, climate or phenology per se, you know, uh, cultures and traditions within herds of routes that take. But it is something we're working on, and I, I don't have a, a, um, a real definitive answer on that right now, whether it's tracking um, fine-scale green-up or uh, routes that are simply the, the least cost path to get from point A to point B. Um, it's that middle scale that we really need to focus on so that we can answer that, because that's ultimately what we need to know. Is, you know when, when, when projects are proposed that are going to result in some kind of obstruction, whether it be a mine or, or a subdivision or a highway, um, we really need to get at the, the um, the actual routes these animals are most likely to take so that we can mitigate those to some degree. Thanks again, Dave. Well, it looks like that was the last question, so um, I think I'll go ahead and wrap things up. Um, Dave, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to present to us today, and I'd also like to thank the audience for attending today's webinar. And as I said earlier, I'll be in touch via email with the recording and some other resources. So goodbye, everyone, and enjoy your day.